Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno and welcome back to my C++ series. And today we're going to be talking all about strings in C++. Two videos that you should watch if you haven't already are the pointers video, the video on pointers, and the last week's video, or rather two days ago video, which was um, about arrays, because as we're soon about to discover, strings are very much tied with arrays. So first of all, what is a string in general? A string is essentially a group of characters. By characters, I mean letters, numbers, symbols, that kind of stuff. It's basically text. So it's very, very common for us as humans, of course, to want to represent text um, in, some, in some way, shape or form on our computers. So we have this problem of when we're programming, we want to be able to represent text and that kind of group of text, it could be a single character, it could be an entire paragraph, it could be a single word, it could be a bunch of words, all of that stuff, that's called a string. It's a string of text. So we need some way to be able to represent that in our program. And that's what a string in C++ is. It's a way for us to actually be able to represent and manipulate that text. So to understand how strings work, which is really what we're gonna talk about. I mean, in this C++ series, you know that I like to kind of go in depth and to share with you guys how things actually work. Because like for me personally, when I'm learning something new, I really, really like to understand how it actually works. That helps me understand the ways that I can use it because if, if you just tell me what I should do as far as strings go, for example, that's cool. Like I know what a string is. However, in the future, when I run into something and I'm not sure if it will work or not, if I know how the underlying technology works, I can kind of make, make an educated guess and determine whether or not what I'm trying to do is even possible in the first place. So to understand how strings work in C++, you first need to understand how characters work and what, what characters actually are. So characters being things like letters, symbols, numbers, they're represented in various forms. And this is not going to be a tutorial or a, or a video about all the different kind of character encoding systems that we have in the world because there are probably too many to count and they're all very complicated and they're all very kind of depending on what, what the specification actually is. So uh, we're not gonna get too in depth about that, maybe in a future video, but we are gonna talk about how characters work in general. Now you may have noticed already that there is a data type in C++ called char, which is short for character. And so far we've kind of used it with the reference of this is one byte of memory. And so it's useful for being able to do things like cast pointers into a char pointer. So you can do pointer arithmetic in terms of bytes. It's also useful for allocating memory buffers because if you wanna allocate, if you wanna allocate one kilobyte of memory, you can just allocate 1024 chars and there you go. But it's also very useful for strings and text because the way that C++ treats characters by default or at least ASCII characters, again, text encoding, not trying to get into that in this video, but the way that we kind of deal with characters in C++ is in the form that a character is one byte. And that is what ASCII is. There's extended ASCII and there's a, a lot of other, there's UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. We have things like wide strings and we have, we have of course, character sets that in, in which characters are way above one byte. We have two byte characters, three byte characters, four byte characters. With other languages, such as Japanese or Chinese or languages that basically have different characters than the ones we see in English, we need to be able to use them because they're simply not enough codes. If we only have one byte to represent a character, that's eight bits, which means we have two to the power of eight possibilities of what that number would be, which is 256 possibilities. There are way more than 256 characters if you take into account English letters, numbers, symbols, you know, Japanese letters, Korean letters, all of that kind of stuff. So we can't fit all languages into, you know, 8-bit character sets, that wouldn't work. So we have like UTF-16, for example, which is a 16-bit character encoding, which means that we have two to the power of 16 different possibilities, which is 65,536 different character codes. We have all these other things, but in C++, just the baseline language without any library kind of usage, just the primitive data type char is one byte, which is why when you use a string, as we're about to in C++, not a wide string, which is two bytes per character, but a normal string, which uses a normal char as each character, we're talking about one byte characters, and we're primarily talking about just being able to do English. If you're going to need to do some other language, such as Russian, you're not gonna be able to do that using this. You're gonna to have to use some kind of different 
character encoding, which we can talk about other languages and all that in the future. But it's it's interesting to talk about strings because strings and text and, and all that stuff, and maybe later in terms of game engines, font rendering is actually a hugely complicated problem that, over, that most people overlook. Just text in general and language is is a massive, massively complicated problem. Okay, so that's a pretty big introduction, but let's talk about how strings actually work in C++. Characters. I mentioned characters, I mentioned the char data type. A string is basically an array of characters. That's why I wanted you guys to watch that arrays video in the in the description everywhere. A string is just an array of characters. An array being a sort of set of elements, so we have of course a set of characters which make up a string of text. You may have noticed in this series that we've often referred to strings as const char pointers, so let's take a look at how that works. We can declare a C star string by writing const char pointer, the name of the string, like name, and then setting it equal to, in double quotes, some kind of text. So we'll set it equal to Cheno, for example. This is essentially a C style way of defining strings because we do have a library in C++ which makes, which makes string operations much, much easier for us than this, but it's still important to kind of know how this works so that you know how the C++ version works. You also don't need to declare it as const char, but the reason people usually do that is because you really don't want to be going around and changing the value of these since strings are immutable in the sense that you can't just extend a string and make it bigger because this is a fixed allocated block of memory. If you want to have a bigger string, you need to perform a brand new allocation and delete the old string. Now, just because this is a char pointer does not mean this is actually heap allocated. You do not delete these things by either calling delete name or delete name or anything like that. We haven't talked about new and delete and all of this kind of heap allocation, stack allocation stuff coming very, very soon. I know that we need to get into this, but the rule of thumb is just, if you don't use the new keyword, don't use the delete keyword. So in this case, we made this cherno string. We didn't write new char or something like that. We just wrote cherno, so no delete required. If you do declare const, that of course means that you can't change the contents of this. Again, we'll have a const video in the future, but you cannot, for example, change the third character here, which was the letter E, to be something like A. You, you won't be able to do that because you marked it as const. So if you know that you're not gonna be modifying the string, you can mark it as const, otherwise you can just leave it as a char pointer, that's totally fine. Okay, so the next question is, cool, this is a string. What does this look like in memory and how exactly does it work? So we'll set a breakpoint over here and just hit F5 to run our program so that we can look at the memory that makes up name. If I go to my memory view over here and type in name, it's already a pointer, so I'm gonna just hit enter. You can see that we have a bunch of memory here. And if you look over here, we have the word cherno. So what this side of the memory view is, is basically an ASCII representation of this. These are all individual bytes, and this is what that byte would be if you converted it into ASCII. You can check out certain websites such as ASCIItable.com, which has a table of what those ASCII codes actually are. So you can see in this case, we have 43, this is in hexadecimal. So if we go to the hex column here, find 43, you can see that it corresponds to a capital letter C. That's what you see over here. That, that's the first letter of Cherno. Now ignoring all of these other strings, which are basically debug only helpers, you can see that we have those six characters which make up the word cherno, and then we have a byte that is set to zero. This is called the null termination character. That is how we know that that is where the string ends. You'll note that we never, we don't know what the size of cherno is. We can't, it's just a pointer, right? So how can we find out what the size is? That's where that null termination character comes in. A string begins at, the, at that pointer, at that memory address, and then it continues on until it hits a zero. That's how when we decide to print this out to the console, for example, we can write a, a cout name. If I were to rerun this, you can see that we get Cherno printing to the console and yet it's just a pointer. So how does it know where it ends? It runs into that zero and it realizes, okay, that's my null termination character. That is the end of the string. If you were to declare this by yourself, so for example, I create a, another string called name2. Uh, I'm gonna do this fully manually, so I'll just make a new char array that's set to six characters. And then I can, I mean, I can initialize it right here. I'll set it equal to the individual characters. Characters in C++, by the way, are defined with single quotes, not double quotes. If it's double quotes, then by default, it becomes a char pointer, okay? Not a string, a char pointer. We'll get into strings in a minute. We have C, H, E, R, N, O. Now, I've, this is an array, not a string, right? It's just an array of six characters. You can see there's no null termination character. So if I try and print name two to the console, in fact, we can, we can inspect the memory as well, but we'll print, it to the, we'll print it to the console here. You can see that we get Cherno and then a whole bunch of random characters, which is again, the ASCII interpretation of whatever the memory was at name two. 
If we go back to this memory view and type in name two, you can see that we have a bunch, we have our Cherno written and then a bunch of weird characters, which is, you can see the memory set to CC, which are actually array guards to let us know that that, that memory is outside of our allocation. Whenever we allocate arrays and memory in debug mode, the, the debug version of the C standard library and C++ standard library will actually insert things like stack guards so that we know we know that we know when we're right outside of the bounds of our allocation. Again, something for another video. So because we don't have that zero here, uh, STDC out does not actually know when to end printing, which is why we get this random thing here. However, if we were to expand this and write zero, either expressed as as a backslash zero, which is the, the actual ASCII character. If we go back to our ASCII table, you can see that, that null is what it actually is. That's how you declare a null. You write a backslash zero. The error here is just because we've got seven characters now, right? Or you can literally write the numeric constant zero as well, because that is the actual value of this. If we hit F5, you can see now it prints Cherno properly with nothing else. That's how char arrays work. That's how strings basically work. That's what a string is. It's a collection of characters. I think that I think that's probably deep enough. If you have any other questions about how that actually works, just leave a comment below. I'll try and answer as many as I can. I don't, I think I've mentioned everything. Okay, so C++, how does C++ come into this and how should we be actually making strings in C++? The standard library in C++ has a class called string. It actually has a class called basic string, which is a template class and std colon colon string is basically a templated version of that basic string class, which is templated with char. It's a, it's a, what do I, it's a template specialization. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, of the basic string class with char as the template parameter, which means char is the underlying data type for each character. So that is really what you should be using. There is something called W string, which is for wide strings. Again, we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna keep it real simple here. STD string is what you should be using for strings in C++. How does standard string actually work? Basically, it is, it's just that. It's a char array. It's, a, it's an array of chars and a bunch of functions built to manipulate it. Later on in this series, when we start talking about data structures, we're actually going to write our own data structures. So all of the C++, all of the kind of C++ data structures that you see in the standard template library, we're going to manually write our own version of that and see how, and see how that works and how we can optimize it and all of that stuff. So stick around for that if you're interested. But for now, it's just a char point. It's basically just an array of characters and functions built to manipulate that. So let's talk about how we can use standard string. Okay, so back here in our program, we'll change this current setup to use a standard string. So for the first thing we need to do is include string. IOStream actually does have a definition to string. However, if we want to be able to print it to the console, as we'll see in a minute, you do actually need to include the string header file. We'll change this char pointer to be an std string, and that's actually it. We're done. String has a constructor that actually takes in a char pointer or a const char pointer. If you hover your mouse over this, you'll see that it is actually a const char array, not a char array. That's one thing that I forgot to mention when talking about const char pointers. That's why you typically assign it to a const char pointer because instead of just a char pointer, because intrinsically it is, when, when you define strings, like literally double quotes and then a word or multiple words in C++, it's actually a const char array, not just a char array, but again, an implicit cast to a char pointer if you need to manipulate the contents of the string, totally fine. So printing this again, we can just call name two. You can see this is a lot cleaner than having a const char pointer. If we hit F5, you can see it works the same way. Now, if I hadn't included this string header file and just dealt with IO stream, you can see we get an error on this output stream operator telling us that we cannot send a string into this into the C out output stream because the overload for this operator that allows us to push string in there is inside that is inside this header file. Okay, that's why I include a string even though IO stream actually does have a definition for it. And of course, because this is a proper class with a bunch of functions, we actually have all of these methods such as name.size. We can find out what the size is. If we just had a const char pointer or a char pointer, we would actually have to use C functions like sterling, which is the length of a string and stir copy, for example, to, to copy strings and all of this stuff. We have those functions defined for us inside the string class, which makes it lovely. That is how we use strings. Now, another common thing that you might find yourself doing is appending strings. I want to do cherno plus hello or something like that. Now, you might get errors here. The reason this is happening is because you're actually trying to add two const char arrays, right? This double quoted kind of thing is a const char array. It's not not an actual string or it's not a string. You can't just add two pointers together. It doesn't, or two arrays together. It doesn't work that way. So if you want to do something like this, 
A nice easy way to do that is either split this up into multiple lines because now you're doing name plus equals hello. So what you're doing is you're adding a pointer to an actual name, which is a string. You're adding it to a string and plus equals is overloaded in the string class to be to let you to let you do that. Or one thing that I do quite often as well is just surround one of them with the string constructor. So you're explicitly calling a string constructor. So you're making a string out of this and then appending that to it as well. And that will be totally fine. Sure, this way you might end up with more copies, but for most reasons, for, for, like for most purposes, it's, it's fine. If you want to find text in a string, you can use name.find and then the string of text that you want to look for. For example, I want to look for no inside cherno hello. So I'll do name.find no. If that does not equal, uh, string, st, it'll be st, std string and pause, which is basically an illegal position for that find, then it contains that no thing because what name.find actually returns is the position of this text. So in this case, it would return the position of the beginning of this. So if you just wanna see if it contains something or not, you use this because there's no actual dot contains function. Anyway, I could, I could go on and describe the entire string API to you. I've linked a CPP reference kind of link to strings in the, in the description below. So you can check that out if you want to see everything that that string class offers. But yeah, that's strings, super easy to use. We'll be using them a lot in the future and in other series that I'm maybe gonna start soon, wink. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. One other thing that I wanna quickly mention is passing these strings around to other functions. If I write, if I wrote a function called print string and I wanted to be able to pass a string around, I would not simply write std string string and then have my, you know, C out string. The reason I wouldn't do this is because this is actually a copy. We haven't talked about this too much, but when you pass in a class like this to a function, what you're actually doing is you're creating a brand, you're, you're creating a copy of that class, of that object and giving it to this function. So if I then was to do something like string plus equals H or something, it wouldn't affect the original string that was passed in, say, over here. However, this is clearly a read-only function. We're not, we're not going to be modifying anything. We just want to print it. So why would we copy an entire string? Copying a string means we have to dynamically on the heap allocate a brand new char array to store that exact same text that we've already got. That's not fast. String copying is actually really quite slow comparatively, and it's 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 a major choke point in some cases because string operations are so common. So whenever you pass a string like this and it's gonna be read only, make sure you pass it by const reference, okay? So we'll add const over here at the front and reference. What that tells us is that we this is a reference, meaning that it won't get copied and const means we're promising not to modify it here. Again, I say promising because technically we could override that if we wanted to, but of course we're, we're promising not to. So we're gonna be we're gonna be nice. I'll have a video in the future about const references, a, a more kind of deeper video, because there's a lot to them and there's a few tricks that we can talk about. But that is basically what strings are. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. If you really enjoy this series and you want to see more videos like this, you can support me on patreon.com forward slash the channel. There's a really nice community we've got going on Slack. I'm actually thinking of maybe switching to Discord because I think Patreon offers Discord rewards. Uh, and kind of it's all built in, so it might be a bit better. But um, basically, if you pledge a certain amount, you get access to drafts of videos as well as a, a, like a, a discussion thread in which we can actually talk about what goes into these videos and plan them together. So that's pretty cool. And of course, it helps me make more videos, which is, which is always good. If you guys have any questions about this episode or about strings or anything, you can just leave a comment below. I'll try to reply to as many as I can. In this video, I kind of took it a bit more easy with the kind of, I didn't script anything as much. This was more of a casual kind of conversation. Let me know what you think of these kinds of videos. They kind of may get a bit rambly. I'm just looking at the time here and a lot has passed, but I kind of like these more laid back videos. They're a bit easier for me to make as well. And I'm, I don't think I'm as stressed because I'm back in Melbourne now and I'm going to work every day and just coming home and just having a nice conversation with the camera probably means that I can probably release more than one video a week, which is, which is, which is good, I think. So let me know what you think about that in the comments below and I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.